This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. RCMI member and retired naval officer Gordon Lacko has vast experience as a naval technical advisor to major film productions, including the Napoleonic-era epic Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World. In 2020, he acted as technical advisor to the film Greyhound, a very faithful adaptation of C.S. Forrester's classic tale of the Battle of the Atlantic, The Good Shepherd. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to RCMI's Virtual Military History Night, Wednesday, June 16, 2021. My name is Patricia Hyde-White, organizer of this event. And this presentation will be videotaped for educational purposes and available for viewing on our CMI YouTube channel. There will be a question and answer following this presentation and ask, the, and ask you that you mute your mics and hold any questions until that time. Our guest speaker this evening, our CMI member Gordon Lacko, would like to do his own introduction. So without further ado, a warm welcome and over to you, Gordon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, I was uh, doing a talk once uh, in the States and the, uh, the, my host gave such a, a thorough introduction of myself that I, I uh, took a terrible risk. They tell you when anybody's teaching you how to uh, speak in public, you shouldn't make jokes just off the cuff. So what I did was uh, crumple up a blank piece of paper and throw it on the floor in front of the podium and say, thanks for the introduction, Matt. There goes the first third of my talk. Everybody laughed, thank goodness. And I'd been told just minutes before the talk not to make jokes about George Armstrong Custer because Monroe, Michigan, where I was speaking was where he lived. So I uh, commented that I was told not to make jokes about Custer and crumpled another blank piece of paper and threw it on the floor in front of the stage. And when I did that, nobody laughed, but three people dove and tried to pick it up to see what the joke was. Thank goodness there was really no joke. So <clears throat> in the Navy, they teach officers when you're speaking uh, to ship's companies, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. I'm just going to do the first two tonight. So the uh, initial part of this talk will be an introduction of myself. Then we're going to uh, talk about the uh, making of the film Greyhound, the nuts and bolts and meat and potatoes of how we did that. And uh, there'll be a question and answer period afterwards. Uh, I have to say myself, I look forward to that most. When I'm making a film, I always uh, am curious about which of the gaffes or flubs or intentional omissions that we make in the process of shooting the film, the audiences will notice. And I have to say in uh, 27 years of filmmaking, I'm always surprised that the, the issues I think we're going to get crucified about are not the ones that people get excited about. So uh, let me have it at the end and I look forward to talking with you about what you folks, uh, those of you who've seen the film think. Um, our film was set in the Battle of the Atlantic. Uh, we can talk about the Battle of the Atlantic afterwards, but I'll say before we start that uh, for the Royal Canadian Navy, uh, it's the big story, it's certainly the big story in World War II. Uh, one of our captains, I believe it was Hal Lawrence, uh, was a, uh, a Lieutenant Commander in England at a mess dinner during the war. And he was being teased by a British officer commenting that Canada doesn't have any traditions of its own. Uh, we borrow everything we've got from them from the Brits. And Hal wrote in his autobiography that he'd had a few drinks and was one of the rare moments in his life when he thought of the right thing to say at the right moment. And he commented, uh, yes, yeah, sure, we celebrate uh, the victory of the Battle of Trafalgar as you do, but we have our own Trafalgar. It's being fought and won in the Atlantic Ocean right now. What a line. I've never forgotten that. And uh, maybe someday I'll, uh, I'll uh, tribute Hal Lawrence by helping put it in the in the uh, lips of an actor. But with uh, without further ado, I'll start the slides and I'll discuss the project at, uh, as we go through it. And then I'll look forward to talking with you folks afterwards. Let's see if I can do this smoothly. So share screen, share, 
and we need to get that key that says slideshow and start from beginning. There we are. Okay. Um, that's a nice picture of a very forthright look at Tom Hanks. I'll speak about him more as we get as we get through. So just a bit about me. Uh, I uh, operate a business that I call GH Flock of Associates, one of whom is one of my sons. And we operate a business outfitting museum ships with rigging and hardware and weapons sometimes and consulting on programs. Uh, I am also the uh, national distributor and importer for Epiphanus Yacht Coatings. If anybody's seen our varnish, they know what that's about. I've recently accepted a position with the Royal Canadian Navy as a, a senior strategic outreach advisor. That's something I'm still learning about, but I have to say it's very exciting to still be involved, although I'm not in uniform anymore. And uh, what relates to tonight's talk is I have a thriving practice that's been going for over 25 years, historical consulting and technical advising to film and television projects. Those range from uh, the 448 BC Olympics right up to uh, issues involving uh, the uh, uh, the Balkan Wars. I got into my career in the uh, uh, the Canadian marine industry, and uh, life led me to move to Midland, Ontario, in 1989. Uh, when I moved here, I, already with a great interest in history. I discovered a, a site that was then called a historic site that it was then called the Historic Naval and Military Establishments. It's called Discovery Harbor now. And I had never heard of the place. And I thought it was quite a shame that I, as a naval history enthusiast, uh, I was a civilian back then, uh, really was the sort of person they needed to reach out to. So I started writing notes and letters and going to volunteer meetings. And they called my bluff and made me the marketing manager. And later I became. Uh, also captain of one of the two schooners. That's HMS Tecumseh and HMSB in that uh, photograph. I quickly learned when I settled in my seat as one of the marketing managers of the place that uh, enrollment uh, at the site was declining dramatically. We were in an era when uh, uh, hospitals and schools were being underfunded funded, and there was great terror that the historic site would uh, have its feathers trimmed. So going out on a flyer, I uh, risked a lot by investing what was left of my advertising budget and uh, created a profile for us on the Ontario Film Development Corporation's site, or it wasn't a site in those days, it was a file. And my plan was to seduce film companies to come and use uh, the naval site and St. Marie Among the Hurons as shooting locations and arranged a way for us to retain the site fees that we earned that way and basically we would create our own advertising budget and that worked pretty well but what worked uh unexpectedly well was that i found i had someone of an aptitude of being a peacemaker between museum people and movie people who have very different outlooks on how things should work uh, museum people often are all about preservation if uh, nobody comes to a plate to the site for a day well secretly that's probably not really a bad thing because it means there's no wear and tear on anything and uh, serious academic work can get done. Movie people contract to use one of the schooners, for example, or a building. They arrive like the circus coming to town and they start driving nails and 200 year old doors and, and so forth. And uh, warfare can, can erupt. And my job was partly as a peacemaker. I found I liked consulting on documentaries and TV shows a lot. So when I returned to the private sector in the marine business, I kept uh, making documentaries and small projects uh, on as a part-time basis. I found I always had one beginning, one in process and one ending, and that continued for quite a number of years. Uh, one of the, uh, the first big show I did was a, uh, a, a feature film for television called The Crossing starring Jeff Daniels. And I made contacts and friends there that stood me in good stead later. Uh, that's me in the uh, mid 90s, uh, marshalling a group of uh, extras and actors we were using as the American Revolutionary Army before the big crossing of the Delaware River. There's always problems making a movie that, uh, despite uh, the best efforts, uh, can develop unforeseen. And one on that project was that uh, the California people from LA, who were the producers, uh, found that. Uh, Surprise, surprise, it's not winter in Canada in April. 
So the picture was supposed to take place on a wintry Christmas Eve in 1775 or six, excuse me for forgetting now. Uh, but spring was well advanced in the Hamilton, Ontario shooting locations we had. So thinking swiftly, I arranged for dump truck loads of leaves to be brought in from the city of Hamilton's composting sites, which we distributed everywhere where the camera's arc of view was. And that white you see behind my head there is not snow, it's white fiberglass insulation that we spread around to give the look of, a, uh, of an American winter in Maryland. The gentleman smirking at me there to the uh, left of me is a friend with some experience as a historic reenactor. Uh, they gave us 200 extras off the street who know nothing about weapons or history or, or military tactics. And I had a very short time to train them. So what we did with uh, colleagues I worked with then was designate the few real reenactors we had and make them corporals. And that string on his shoulder is an authentic representation of a corporal in the American Continental Army. And we trained our corporals, well, they were already pretty well trained, and each of them trained their platoons. And that's just like the military and the whole project eventually worked out pretty well. Uh, small projects continued, as I said, for 10 years until one day sitting at my desk at Transat Marine in Barrie, where we were national distributors for a number of lines of uh, Marine gear. My phone rang and it was my friend Richard Bailey, who was captain and general manager of a 500 ton wooden frigate uh, reproduction named HMS Rose. She operated on the coast of uh, the uh, east coast of the USA. And uh, Richard was, uh, was and is a very good ship manager. But uh, in that phone call he made to me in the year uh, 2001, it advised me that I would need to stand by to replace all his rigging. And I needed to act fast because he'd already FedExed me the diagrams, which would land on my desk very shortly. In fact, they landed just a few hours after he called me. I said, yes, I can do that, uh, put the phone down. And then I thought, good heavens, he can hardly pay his phone bill most of the time. Where's he getting a hundred plus thousand dollars? And I called him right back and said, who's doing a Patrick O'Brien film? Well, he said, I didn't tell you that and I can't talk about it. Well, that was enough for me. Three months later, I'd finally found the producers and about uh, six or seven months after that, uh, I found myself hired as the uh, technical advisor for a film called Master and Commander, which was then in, in uh, early pre-production stages. And yes, I did sell them the rope too. Oh, uh, sorry, one more. Um, one good thing that came out of that production, aside from the, uh, the professional work, it was about almost two years of work, was that uh, Russell Crowe and Peter Weir and Duncan Henderson, the producer, uh, very kindly uh, hired me to come with them to the premieres. We traveled all over uh, the, uh, Europe and, and North America, uh, where we sat on stages at the premieres and did media scrums and answered questions from the public and the press. And in other parts of the world, people asked me questions about the history and the making of the film. In Canada, the media zeroed in on Local Boy Makes Good. The Globe and Mail did a front page feature with my picture on it. My mother kept it and framed it. And my phone started to ring. And that gave me the courage to literally throw my tie away and become what my wife calls a, a free range chicken. But working on my own, I established my own marine importing business to sort of smooth out the highs and the lows of the film business because it just, my experience of the previous 10 years was that movies are pretty unpredictable. But uh, to quote my accountant doing my taxes this spring, when I said the same thing to him, he said, Gore, this has been pretty steady since 1994. I think this is what you do. So at any rate, um, another good thing that came from Master and Commander was the Royal Canadian Navy noticed me. And after doing a talk for uh, at HMCS York, uh, the Atlantic. About 2004, uh, the commanding officer then stood up and thanked me for my talk and said, uh, my wife's been talking to your wife, and I now know two things about you I didn't know an hour ago. He said, one was that you wished you joined the RCN when you should have, when you were in university. And the other thing is, I know how old you are. At that time, I was 48. He said, uh, you're not quite too old. If you want to go for a commission now, we'll support it. So on the way home that night, Caroline and I discussed the talk and an hour and a half later when we arrived in Midland from Toronto, we'd made the decision that the something special that I thought I would do to treat myself for some of the business successes we'd enjoyed would be to join the RCN. 
and I did, and I served for 11 years. So meantime, the documentaries kept rolling along. Uh, the top left photograph is one that I cooked up myself for history television. I think it's on YouTube now. Uh, if you Google uh, artillery games, you'll see a production we did for history uh, in which we used uh, real historic artillery pieces on an artillery range and pitted them against modern artillery pieces to see what who was good at what. And uh, the answer you'll see if you watch that 40-minute uh, show is uh, which of two guns firing at 1,600 meters hit a target five times out of five, and which gun never hit it once? The answer is a bit surprising. The lower middle picture is uh, a, a soldier uh, in a trench we built near Orangeville, Ontario, uh, for a, a, a series of documentaries we shot that sprang from battlefield, uh, uh, battlefield archaeological expeditions we did at sites on the Somme. That, I have to say, was just about the most moving, uh, terrible, terrifying, uh, exciting uh, work I've ever done in, uh, in the career. When we first arrived uh, uh, in France at the sites of the Somme, I was very excited to be there. But once we started finding the human remains we were looking for, I felt deeply embarrassed that I was excited because we were uh, literally in the very places where some of the worst human tragedies in military history occurred. We came home and shot uh, videos uh, doing our best to depict the last minutes, hours of life of some of the five people we discovered on the first expedition. And because I was in the service by this time, I fell into the practice of hiring sailors from HMCS York to be extras for the various military shows we were doing. Uh, they're, uh, being military people already, they knew a fair bit about the history. They had great reverence for it. They knew how to handle weapons like they meant it. And uh, operationally, if the director says, okay, Gord, line them over, over here, I'd shout squadron, form up here. And instantly 80 people would be in line to uh, shoulder to shoulder. They knew how to do that. Uh, they, they put real zest and verve into our battle scenes. And in every one of those documentaries, we all had the feeling that, that others were watching over our shoulders. So we did our best to honor them. Sometimes, however, it was fun. The picture on the top right is uh, from a documentary we shot near Fort Erie, Ontario, about the Battle of Culloden. What a place to do that. And being a small Canadian TV production, budgets were extremely low, so everybody in the film crew, except the guy handling the video cameras, had to put costumes on to thicken up the good guys or the bad guys on either side. And at one point, when we were having a rest, uh, we were sitting uh, in the encampment we'd built, and you uh, uh, point out on the lower right of that picture, you'll see a, a kilt with a linen shirted arm resting on it. And that was my friend Scotty. And uh, he's really Scottish. And he and I started debating whether a red infantry uniform is more attractive to women than a than long hair, a white linen shirt and a kilt. Of course, he was a protagonist for his outfit. I made him a bet that within five minutes of him saying go, whenever he chose to say go, I could have a pretty young woman I'd never met sitting on my knee because of what I was wearing. He said, go to hell. And then he said, go. What he didn't know was that over his shoulder, I'd been watching a tour bus full of Japanese tourists disgorging. And as soon as he said, go, I stood up and yelled photo right here and slapped my knee. And as you can see, I had four girls and uh, you can see how dejected and limp uh, my friend Scotty's wrist is. And I'm not just grinning in the picture, I'm hissing, somebody take a picture quickly. Because they all sprang away from me once the picture was taken. So uh, that continued for quite a number of years until uh, 2017. Uh, I made over 40, uh, excuse me, over 50 documentaries and, and movies, large and small. And one day that October, my wife was away in Victoria visiting her, her mom. I was home alone, and as usual, I was watching a movie she normally wouldn't watch if she was with me. And I ordered a pizza for supper, and I fell asleep in front of the TV. I woke up at 12.15 and looked at my iPhone and thought, oh, geez, I better go to, go to bed. I didn't mean to fall asleep here. And I noticed there was a text from, with a Los Angeles phone number on it that said, call me now. And that text had come in only half an hour earlier. Well, it turned out. It was from 
David Coatsworth, the director that I'd shot The Crossing with and a number of other shows, who was uh, working for Tom Hanks's Playtone operation. And he told me in a very quick phone call that Hanks's next project was an adaptation of C.S. Forrester's Good Shepherd. I was pretty excited. Uh, and I said yes without an instant's hesitation to join the production. Uh, I'll comment here on the cover of this uh, first edition. Uh, Tom Hanks told me once we met and were working together that he really wanted to do one more production in which he played a commander in, in World War II. But Tom is the same age I am. He's really too old to be in combat. And then somebody gave him a copy of The Good Shepherd. And he noticed on the cover, the captain has white hair. The story is about a man who's too old. That intrigued Hanks, and he set to work writing an ad a screenplay adaptation of that, of that great novel. The novel, of course, is, a, uh, is, a, uh, uh, is loosely based on the real career of the Royal Navy's captain, Frederick Walker, otherwise known as Johnny Walker. Walker was a, uh, a naval officer of great war vintage, who, when the ax swung in the, in the dirty 30s, I had to leave the service and had risen, I believe, to lieutenant commander and was scheduled for, uh, for retirement when the war emergency came. In 1939, he was called back. He went back to sea. And before he died literally of exhaustion before the war was over, he became history's greatest submarine hunter. Quite a man. That's David Coatsworth on the right. And uh, the picture on the left is the last picture I did for David before uh, Greyhound. It was a series called American Gods that involved a Viking ship, which is why they wanted me. I'll tell stories about that later if people want to hear about it. So I found myself in Los Angeles uh, after tuning up my American work permit, which has to be specific to projects, and uh, offered my uh, office space, which I found I shared with Doug Coleman, who I last sat beside when we were shooting uh, uh, Master and Commander 18 years earlier. We looked at each other and laughed and said, he said, Gord, you haven't changed. And I said the same to him. And then we both really laughed because we realized that after the passage of time, we each looked like each other's father. Now, I, I uh, remembered something when I sat down at my desk that I, I never forgot that I learned on Master and Commander, which was my first large feature. I, Peter Weir said at one of the media scrums, when you pick up a good book to turn it into a film, a film a screenplay, all the words fall out. And what he meant was the descriptions, the narration and so forth that the author has the, has the luxury of are gone. Uh, they have to be all put back in with color, with music, with action, and the choices of what you show the audience. And uh, recreating those things and helping put those words back in the pages is very much my job on the films I work on. So for Greyhound, the first thing I did was sit down and work on the, on the script. I remember many years ago, the first time I had a script with my name watermarked on the pages, my mom was very proud. But I said, mom, that's not there to honor me. It's there so they know who to skin if this ever gets out. But I, uh, I went to work on it. I, was, I began tuning <clears throat> the language to be more militarily and naval and historically correct, working with Mr. Hanks and with the director, Aaron Schneider. And I noticed something that I'd noticed when I reread the book before going to LA. And that is that, uh, that Forrester completely omitted from the, uh, from the action in the novel, and subsequently the same thing had happened to the script, of any mention whatsoever of passive hydrophone listening of sounds to, that submarines might be making. There's just nothing about it in the, in the, in the script. I had a, a, one of our a production meetings with, uh, with Hanks and, and Schneider, and I commented on this, and I said, because the novel was written so soon after the war, I'll bet he left that out, as just like he left out mention of advanced weapons like Hedgehog and Squid, because he didn't want to give the game away. Those were still operational security issues, OPSEC issues. And I thought that we should really put the hydrophone uh, storyline back in because by doing so, not only are we more authentic because that's the basic submarine hunting device, hydrophone, but we're, I could also give the director a, in effect, a, an on-screen narrator telling the audience what's going on, describing what he hears, giving the captain's reports, 
and that will help the audience follow what the invisible submarine's doing underwater. So my first assignment then was to write in the lines of dialogue uh, and the actions relating to uh, responses involving the uh, involving sounds that the submarine was making. I'll ask you to take note of the round uh, brass protractor on my desk there. I'll mention that later. So once uh, the script had been tuned somewhat and those parts had been added and uh, we, uh, decisions had been made about what that had done to the budget, those discussions were with David, I was set to work uh, uh, putting on paper pictorial depictions of what was happening in the descriptive sections of the book. Uh, because there are no convoys at sea anymore and there are no corvettes and uh, uh, type seven U-boats and destroyers that can go to sea that are like the ones in World War II, everything was going to be, have to be going to have to be recreated by computer graphics. So what I did was create what turned out to be a collection of over 60 uh, plotting sheets, which of course I'd learned to use in, the, in Naval service, pictorially showing the computer graphics people exactly what was happening whenever there was a description of ships moving in the in the movie. And we would then use those to create the uh, imaginary fleets and ships and warship actions in cyberspace that the audience would see on the screen. So on each one, I would write, as you see in the top left, Dickie and Victor, and those are radio call signs, detached to investigate a contact. Krauss adjusts dispositions of Keeling and Dodge. So two destroyers are leaving, the two remaining escorts have to uh, do their best to cover. And uh, that is what is happening when that's mentioned in that two lines in the book and in the script. On the top left, you see I've written here in pencil script page three, uh, what's happening again and the courses they're steering. Ebook page 11. That's so uh, the director can go to the book itself and find the two and a half pages of description that Forrester wrote saying what's going on, and then looking at the picture and saying, ah, I've got the picture, literally. Things got more complex when submarine hunts and actions were happening. Uh, I also created a, a series of about 30 plotting sheets. Some of them got quite messy as, as things were developing of what is actually happening when a destroyer is hunting a submarine. In this sketch, which is the one we actually used for one of the submarine hunts, the pencil drawings of the ship shapes with the arrows pointing on them uh, are the destroyer's movements and there are corresponding positions on the red dotted line for where the presumed submarine is when each of the actions and the commands are being given. So this is scenes uh, 23 to 31, book pages 23, 24, 25. That's what's going on in that part of the book. And you can see uh, right under that comment up on top left, the sneeze. There's a sneeze that happens if you've seen the movie. The uh, I think the kid at the telegraph does the engineer telegraph and he is rebuked for it. Well, that's what's happening with the ship and the submarine at that instant. I have to find markers like that to give the uh, director so the computer compositors know where to put the uh, put the vessels. Pretty intense work, especially when things start changing as they as they develop. So we go from horrible sketches like that to the computer software. And I literally broke a couple of pair of shoes, broke the shanks in them from squatting behind the computer artists as they took the script, which is on the laptop in the lower part of the picture, my sketches, and then put them into the cyber world of the North Atlantic Ocean that was the playing field for the movie. And uh, all the ships and the submarines and the actions and so forth move through it in real time. And what you see in the film are snapshots we take from that so that we have everything in the right places at the right times. If you see a tanker doing eight knots in one scene and we have a time jump and it's now 17 minutes later, well, how far does that thing go at eight knots? Well, I can figure that out. That's my, that's my trade. So I, uh, I can help the compositors put that ship in the right place. So when we look for it again, we see it where it should be. Is that complicated? Oh, yes. So uh, eventually after quite a period of time of that, most uh, much of it involving me working from here at home, uh, we convened again uh, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where there is a large film studio where a movie called Oblivion had just been shot. And in their sound stages, we built uh, a, uh, a perfectly proportioned reproduction 
of a uh, an American destroyer's bridge structure on a nimble so we could rock and roll it, surrounded by, by green screens so we could later drop in our imaginary cyber world of the North Atlantic Ocean and convoys and ships and aircraft and so on, and also various interiors of the ship as well. I had a chair that said Naval Consultant. I got to keep the chair. It's, uh, it's in the house right now, but I hardly ever got to sit in it while we were shooting. I was usually up on the set, standing near the director, ready for questions or ready to make suggestions if I thought they would be helpful. And uh, as you can see, I'm wearing full battle kit there, uh, headphones, so I can hear the director's uh, instructions to the cameraman, uh, a, uh, a, a pack over my shoulder with uh, reference material and scripts and so forth. And behind me is a pile of computer equipment, which is the onset uh, containment of the, of the imaginary cyber world that the movie was set in. I'll talk more about that in, in just a minute. So in the course of shooting the film, sometimes the director or somebody or sometimes me would get an idea, in which case, uh, as you see on the right, oh, that's the director's hands, he'd make a quick sketch of what he wants to see. On the top of his picture, you can see a, pro, uh, a, a floor plan, basically, of the Fletcher class destroyers bridge with the point of view for Mr. Hanks. And uh, he's describing for me, he wants Hanks to see the U-boat being blown to the surface and then engaged by the Canadian Corvette Dickey otherwise uh, known as, uh, as HMCS Dodge, an imaginary vessel. So I would take that and make a cleaner sketch that would I then take to the computer compositors so we could change the cyber world. So when we're standing up on the bridge set and we can tell the actors which directions to look to see the things that are happening and what expressions and so forth to have. And incidentally, this scene I've sketched here, I see is 57, uh, minutes 25.3 seconds into the film it's when dicky shot full of holes is swerving away to starboard to clear the field for greyhound to clobber her with her five inch main battery that's a pivotal moment in the film here's another action and this one here is uh is is uh uh the describing the motions we had to come up with to facilitate the first time a U-boat is sunk. And the interesting thing is, in the book and in the early scripts, the first U-boat sunk was actually the third hunted. The U-boats managed to evade uh, Hanks's character the first two times because they could outsmart him. And the point of the lesson in the book and in the early script was that he's learning his lessons. He's inexperienced, but he's learning. And uh, we lost that in editing. So we had to jump straight to the first success and the lesson that Hanks's character learned was that the Type 7 U-boat, even submerged, can turn in a much tighter circle than a Fletcher-class destroyer, especially when she's going fast. So instead of trying to follow the U-boat, as he did the first times, which we don't see in the movie anymore, we, uh, rather I had uh, the destroyer turn to starboard and circle and meet the U-boat coming the other way and not even try to follow it through the turn, which ultimately turns out to be how how he catches the U-boat. Movies love uh, epiphany moments like that, or aha moments when the, uh, when the star uh, has made a brilliant choice. And oh, how I wish we'd been able to keep the two failed hunts in there because it would have put this one in much better context. Interesting moment there, we, we were describing uh, what's actually going on. And the director said to me, Gordon, how deep would this submarine be? And I said, well, the Type 7 could go a lot deeper than its rated depth. So I'm going to guess between 600 and 700 feet down. Six or 700 feet? Well, how do they know where they're going? So I started describing, again, uh, time, speed, distance, dead reckoning. And I could just see eyes glazing. They don't really want to hear all that detail. And there was a constant misapprehension among people who had no reason to know anything about submarines that they have to travel around with their periscopes up all the time near the surface. Well, they don't. I would explain they dive to hide, and they're hiding because they want to survive and go home. We mustn't make them do things that make them look foolish, because they're just as professional as our guys are. And uh, that was uh, something that we, we discussed often through the film. Incidentally, for those who have read the book uh, and also seen the film, I don't think it's any accident that Forrester gave the protagonist destroyer captain a German-sounding name. I think he wanted the German captain to be just like just like our hero. I think they, 
we wanted to see a battle of, of wits and intelligence and strength and professionalism and sometimes chivalry between those, those two commanding officers. I don't think that was an accident. So in the midst of shooting down in Baton Rouge, uh, the US Navy sent a captain to come and uh, talk to us. He had under his uh, arm a binder full of complaints about the script. And uh, he was a, a good man. I, I won't uh, disparage him in any way, but he was completely unfamiliar with the history of the Battle of the Atlantic. For the US Navy, the Pacific War is the big story, just as for us, the Battle of the Atlantic is. And he had no idea that it was standard operating procedure for U-boats to penetrate convoys on the surface at night. He had no idea that there were significant actions where submarines had been blown to the surface only to fight it out with gunfire and sometimes pop bottles and pistols at very close range. He thought those things were unrealistic fabrications. What he really didn't like was, uh, especially in the earlier versions of the script, the American uh, commanding officer being depicted as doubting his what he's doing and being afraid and becoming exhausted and making bad decisions and forgetting things. And uh, I was detailed to deal with the, uh, the US captain and uh, having been in the service myself, I knew exactly what an exalted thing on earth a captain is, but I'm a civilian now. So when we went to dinner afterwards, I made a point of calling him by his first name. And when he started uh, in on me about his, his duty to present the United States Navy as a decisive and invincible force to the American public and the world, I looked at him in the eye and over our uh, stakes, I said, Ross, you need to crack a book, my friend. In the winter of 1942, the United States Navy had everything to learn. It was not invincible. It was completely inexperienced. The story is they did learn, but not at the beginning for them. 1942 was the just past the height of the war for us, but for the Americans, it was the beginning and they had everything to learn. And he looked horrified and I felt bad for him. So I leaned forward again and I said, Russ, does it not honor your service more deeply to show that it wasn't easy? The Germans weren't stupid. They were very good. And your your commanding officers and your seamen had to learn fast and they did. Isn't that a story that honors them more deeply than making it look easy? And he smiled at me and said, Gordon, we never think of it that way. Well, if I helped him think of it that way, I did a, a lot of good that evening. So as I said, the uh, ships in the movie and the sea is largely uh, created uh, in, in the imaginary cyber world in meetings, we discussed the uh, and looked at the waves that we were creating with incredibly talented artists. And it occurred to us that our waves didn't look right. And it's very difficult to get a proper wave train down the length of a hull of a ship at various speeds. So the idea was floated to try to find a real ship to put a team aboard to film it in the North Atlantic Ocean and see what those waves really looked like. Well, <clears throat> I made a phone call to Ottawa, called some of my colleagues that I'd rec uh, recently worked with before I retired from the service. And the funny story I tell at dinner parties here is, as Lieutenant Gordon Lack, ORCN, I couldn't call Ottawa and ask for a frigate and get one. But as technical advisor on a Tom Hanks war movie, I did. It turned out that uh, HMCS Montreal was about to do workups. And the Royal Canadian Navy learning uh, who was producing the film and uh, who was starring in it and what the subject was. And yes, there was a Canadian warship being featured largely in the story. They made it possible for us to put our team aboard HMCS Montreal and send them to sea for two weeks. That was January of 2018. And I'm pleased to say that the North Atlantic Ocean performed admirably. Our guys were seasick almost the whole time they, it was so windy most of the time, their drones could hardly fly. But we got shots of warships doing over a warship doing over 25 knots. We got shots of her doing hard turns. We got shots of her speeding up and slowing down in various sea states and at various attitudes to the uh, pr prevailing swells. And we uh, got shots of her firing her uh, tracer at night. When you see in the film tracer being fired at night, those are 50 caliber guns being fired off Montreal. And I have to say, I was so proud of our, of our Canadians when my American team came back describing what, what they called a can-do attitude on board that, that ship. They were completely impressed with uh, the ship's company of HMCS Montreal. 
And Hanks showed his quality by trying to pay for it afterwards. But of course, the Navy can't ex accept pay. So what the production did instead was made a donation to the Children's Hospital in the city of Montreal in the name of HMCS Montreal for an amount that would be a good down payment for a house these days, even if these inflated prices. That's a measure of the quality of, of Hanks and his team. And my salute is to uh, the people of HMCS Montreal. Did I get to go with them? No, I was working on the script. So back in Baton Rouge, uh, when we were shooting again, uh, it occurred to me also that we had another device in the uh, story that we could use to make, an, in effect, a, a narration. And that is the activity in what the Americans call the Combat Information Center of the warship, what we call the Ops Room or Operations Room. That in World War II is where plotting tables and charts and graphs and teams of men uh, and sensing devices kept track of everything that was happening around the vessel. And by means of updates going on those tables, we were able to, in effect, show the audience what was going on. So on the picture on the left, uh, you can see the circular light table, which with dispositions of ships on it, uh, marked in grease pencil. We marked those in real time and uh, shot uh, video footage of it so the we could drop scenes in showing the audience what was going on. On the right, you can see one of the status boards. I filled in those as accurately as I could with real information of real ships that were in the story, but sometimes I had to make things up. On the spur of the moment, I didn't know what FL Sender was, so I just wrote my name there. IFF codes, well, that's uh, identify friend or foe. I said none because we're in the middle of the North Atlantic. Uh, base course 087, that's the course of the convoy. Speed 18 knots, that's what speed our destroyer is zigzagging at and so, and so on and so forth. And we kept that updated and made use of it through the film. This is a shot that I'm glad someone took because I was too busy to take pictures myself, but that is me uh, working on the chart table with Stephen Graham uh, who played the XO of the destroyer. Stephen's a superb actor. Uh, this is the first time I've worked with him. And in his opening scene in the film is when they're calling to action stations, running down a, uh, uh, a huff tough contact. Stephen came to me with his English accent, which he normally has when he speaks normally. Uh, he said to me, Gordy, how far is it from my cabin to my battle station? And I pictured the Fletcher class destroyer and I pictured up this companionway down that flat around this corner blah, blah, blah. And I said, it's about 30 meters. And he said, right, thanks mate. And he ran in a circle for about 30 meters timing himself so when they called action cue steven he jumped into the combat information center set looking like he'd just run 30 meters as hard as he could perfect what a consummate professional that man was um despite that though uh and that's that's me showing him how to use parallel rulers uh the director wanted the actions to be snappier he didn't want them to look so careful the way steven was do it uh, was doing it so in those scenes where you just see a pair of hands on the chart or on the light table, those are actually my hands. And you'll see my wedding ring there. Thank goodness I remember to take my Timex watch off. The a lot of the extras in the film were uh, American veterans from uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts like this gentleman here included. Uh, I had some very interesting conversations with them because part of my job was to train them to be servicemen. They already knew, of course, so my, my, uh, my uh, responsibility was limited to showing them what we needed them to do in the film. Those were remarkable young men and I've, I've stayed in touch with some of them. So back up on the bridge, this is an average scene here. That's uh, Mr. Hanks in a t-shirt uh, blocking out his lines. The gentleman in the black t-shirt is Chad Finnerty, a man I worked very closely with all through principal photography. He's the guy who ran the cyberspace computer, that big computer that was behind my chair earlier on. In the picture on the left, that's me in the green shirt right on the edge. That's Aaron, the director, and Tom is behind him. And Chad is holding up a device like a super duper iPad. And what that is, is a window into the virtual world the computer was maintaining around our set. So if you look in that screen that he's holding up and move it, it it's like looking into the cyber world and it'll show you what the computer is. So you'll know where ships are, you know where the horizon is and if there's bullets coming or whatever, they'll be there on that screen. Although you, real human eyes can't see it. So uh, Chad and I worked very closely together, making sure that that was up to date with changes that were being made in the script. 
and uh, helping the actors act like they were really seeing the things around them. So as it pro progressed, uh, this is just a list of some of the things I worried about. I had uh, every day showed up on set with uh, charts that showed what the, uh, what the azimuth and elevation of every gun had to be every time it was fired. We talked at great length about the time of flight of various pieces of ordnance, how uh, ships could behave. We talked about uh, things like what is a flare and what is a star shell? And I would say over and over again, a star shell is a weapon. You use it to illuminate an enemy. It's unfriendly. A flare is a signal. It means here I am, come and help me. And I have to say, we, we got them wrong every time we showed them in the movie, but uh, that's one of the things maybe you folks will pick at me about afterwards. And of course, the bottom, uh, where should the actors be looking in uh, some hypothetical scene? We shot part of the film aboard a museum ship. This is USS, uh, goodness, her name just popped out of my head. I trust it'll pop back in before too much time goes by, USS Kidd. She is a Fletcher-class destroyer uh, that served in World War II. Because she served in the Pacific War, she has a much heavier anti-aircraft armament than uh, her sisters would have had in the Atlantic. But um, <clears throat> perhaps people noticed that. Uh, I hope they didn't too much. When we started filming, uh, the Mississippi River was low, and there she is laying in her cradle, uh, tied up against her gantry. Uh, the steps that look like bleachers on the right of the picture on the left is actually the levee. And I never really understood what a levee was until I'd been on that location for a while. The lower picture on the right is uh, some weeks later, the water is coming up the levee and the Mississippi River has actually for many decades been higher than the towns and cities around it when it's in flood. So we paid very close attention to that. And I'll tell you actually the river came up to the top step but it didn't flood while we were working. We shot uh, LIDAR scans of our own HMCS Sackville in, in uh, Halifax, HMCS Haida, and we went to, we sent a team to Poland to shoot Bliskowicka. Unfortunately, we lost our Polish ship in the story through editing, but I was very proud that uh, our hypothetical Corvette is actually Sackville. And uh, I did something that I've since apologized to the Sackville people for. I gave our hypothetical ship HMCS Shewinigan K136's pennant numbers to honor her in uh, uh, memory of uh, her ship's company that were lost with her all hands, but one man that was left ashore uh, when she sailed on her last patrol in 1944. I uh, participated in our Navy's last search for her. I hope we get to look for her again, but I, I've never forgotten uh, the people I met who were related to those who were lost. And I wanted to, uh, I wanted to honor HMCS Schoenigan in the film, and I was very pleased when people I saw online were noticing that I'd given her K-136. So I'm very sorry, Sackville people, but uh, I, that's why I did that. So uh, that's Tom Hanks uh, waving to a crowd that came by one day. He is everything he seems to be. He's generous, he's courteous, he works very hard. He's probably the best actor I've ever worked with. Uh, there was a scene where he's realizing in the story that he's made a mistake trying to save three men and he has to watch 40 men on a on a tanker burn to death because of his error and when in the book Forrester devoted quite a length of a chapter to describing the emotions in the film you just see that in a few seconds and on the set we had a, a flickering red light shining on his face depicting the flames there was no sound or anything and all he knew where the tanker was, was a kid I had holding a sign that had the name of the ship on it, showing him the bearing to look on, which I ascertained by a, a, a paper Polaris I made that I carried around to give to, uh, act, the actors the right bearings. And Tom looked at that and I saw his face just sag. He closed his eyes, shuddered, and then looked into the wheelhouse and gave his next orders. And he did everything that Forrester had described in his two pages. Uh, he's quite an actor, in the, and in the most artificial circumstances you could imagine. Through the process of, uh, of editing afterwards that lasted quite a long time, a number of months when I was back home in Canada then, uh, they would uh, make available to me drafts of the film or, uh, or cuts, and then I would create documents like this one with uh, uh, time codes to identify the issue I'm making a comment on, 
and they uh, sometimes compliment saying, yep, we got it, that's perfect. Other times offers of corrections. And you can see here, one minute, 57 seconds into the film, I'm complaining that the, the destroyer is much too near the convoy to really be screening it. She needs to be at least a torpedo shot away and long torpedo shots about two miles. Uh, but of course that was something that was difficult for the film to do, so they, they didn't. Uh, and uh, an author who's in the audience here who's seen some of my editing work will understand how I agonize over how to present information like this without uh, in any way denigrating the hard work of many good people who are uh, trying to get things right. So we worked on it for a year, editing and adjusting and adjusting and editing and adjusting and sometimes reshooting. And we were going to launch the film uh, on uh, Battle of the Atlantic Sunday. We had the Royal Navy, the Royal Canadian Navy and the US Navy all set to make a huge celebration of the victory and the end of the, uh, of the Atlantic War. And COVID-19 came, everything went on ice. The, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, a number of uh, months went by and what transpired was that Playtone and Sony who had produced the film made a deal with Apple TV Plus and sold it lock, stock and barrel, including me, to, uh, to be shown on a streaming service. So it became available there. And those of you who've seen the movie have seen it via that Apple service. Uh, I'm very pleased to say it was, uh, it was quite a success uh, in, in those lights. We all wish we could have seen it on the big screen and maybe uh, if normal life ever returns someday, that may become possible in some means. I was uh, hired aboard again to, uh, to help publicize the film, which I was, I was proud to do on behalf of the many people I worked with. Now, one thing that we never forgot while we were shooting the film was that we were depicting ordeals experienced by real people. And one man in particular was always in my mind, and that was a gentleman who was a friend of mine here in Midland named William Lanos. Bill, as I knew him as a gentle old man, was in his younger days an officer in the Royal Canadian Navy. And that's a picture of him when he was a subby aboard HMCS Assiniboine. Bill uh, had his life changed by the war, and I'll quote him in a minute. Uh, but first, I want to say that one of the things he left me when he passed away on VE Day in 1993 was the circular brass protractor that was in that early picture. And you see it there on, on, the, uh, on the right. That was on Assiniboine's uh, bridge chart table during uh, her actions in World War II. And Bill, young man that he was, realized he had witnessed history after one of the actions. He put it in his pocket and he kept it for the rest of his life. And I have it now on the wall beside me as I'm speaking with you. I brought that to the production of Greyhound. Uh, I'm in the habit of bringing evocative, evocative uh, artifacts to help actors understand their roles. And I handed that to Bill, to Tom Hanks. I described to him who William Lanose was, what HMCS Assiniboine endured during the war, her great fight with U2 with U210 south of Greenland, her the slaughter that she participated in off Brest in, 19, in August of 1944, something that Bill remembered with no pleasure whatsoever when he was in the last hours of his own life. And I described all those, and Tom fingered it carefully, and he thanked me. And then I heard him giving instructions that this was to be on the chart table of his destroyer in the film. So every time you see the chart table in glimpses uh, through the movie, you'll see Bill's protractor there, and Tom did that to honor that veteran. And the last thing I'll say in this before we turn to Q&A is something that Bill told me in the last hours of his life. And when I used to give uh, speeches in uniform on, on uh, Battle of the Atlantic Sunday or sometimes on Remembrance Day, I would quote him. And what Bill told me from his hospital bed near the end of his life was he hated the war for it having robbed him of the carefree youth he should have had. He hated it for the, the killing he witnessed and participated in. And I was watching him with his eyes closed and his head on the pillow, thinking about what he'd endured. And then he opened his eyes again and he looked at me with a hard look full of vitality in his eyes. And he said to me, but Gordy, nothing in my life ever matched being officer of the watch aboard a well-armed Canadian destroyer doing 36 knots through the dark off the coast of France, looking for trouble. Thank you, Bill. So that's my talk. 
I'm ready for uh, what Q and A's come. I'll put myself back on the screen here. And uh, I'll see if I can do that without uh, losing you folks. There, uh, there we are. Oh, hello, Fraser. Yeah, oh, Gord. Gord, in, in, you did a lot of training. Did you make any use of Gilbert Roberts' uh, Western Approaches Tactical Unit in Liverpool during the war where he was training those guys in exactly that kind of thing? Uh, I've been doing book reviews recently about a couple of things to do with that. And it would strike me that that would be a good uh, chance for you to learn your job as well. I wonder, did you make any use of his of that? Well, I made use of his model, Fraser. Uh, we, uh, we took all our actors and we put them through a seven-day ordeal aboard USS Kidd, where they stood watches. They got called to action stations. They had they got called to abandoned ship stations. They uh, were told there was a fire on the foredeck. Uh, they uh, they went through that for a week, and uh, uh, from top to bottom, they all did it. And uh, uh, we did our best to re re to reproduce the horror of the Western Approaches uh, Escort School. And, and, and all the guessing that went on either there or at the training base in Tobermory under Monkey Stevenson. Right. Yeah. I, so th exactly that kind of thing you were doing. Uh, I, t I, I told them the story of the, uh, the Admiral that came aboard a Canadian Corvette, threw his cap on the deck and then shouted to a young seaman, that's an unexploded shell, deal with it. So the kid kicked it overboard. Yeah. I said, don't do that. But... <laughs> Uh, we, we did that, Fraser. And nice to see you. Yeah. Oh, it's a very good, that was a very good talk. I heard your early one, and it was nice to see a different side of it from a technical point of view. Thank you. Gordon? Yes. Oh, hello, it's Ted. Ted. It's, it's Ted here. I, I can't seem to get the video connection here. I don't know whether, how that does here. But in any case, um, you and I know from having shared some stories on the Battle of the Atlantic, um, how big, big a stories, and yet <clears throat> how remarkable the small stories of individuals is in making all the big story happen, if you understand what I'm driving at. What, one of the things that I think you managed to, or you collectively managed to do in the film is to maintain the contextual uh, excitement of the breadth of the story while not losing the, the humanity, the personalities, even on one ship. Did you have any hand in that at all or, or sense where the line was to help them make sure that that wasn't lost? Yeah, thanks, Ted. And I'm really, really glad you saw that because that's really what the story is about. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I salute uh, Tom Hanks and Aaron Schneider for that, uh, the director and star and producer and writer. All those titles were in those two men's uh, portfolio. They would, uh, they would use information I gave them to achieve those things, but they led in those areas. Uh, it, it's very much uh, uh, Tom and, uh, and Aaron's style to feature the small story while telling the big one. And I'm really glad you saw that because, because that's what it's about. It's about. It's about fear. It's about overcoming fear. It, it's about having you know, your feet hurt, but you've got to stay on watch. And uh, we put all those small things in. Thank you, Ted. Pleasure. I've seen this talk a couple of times, Gordon, and I never retire. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Actually, I should interpose here. When I was in uniform still, uh, and I often did public speaking for the Navy, sometimes a senior officer would say, Gord, that was great. Can you give me the, your, uh, your, your, your script? And I'd say, no, I can't. <laughs> I just I start talking and I watch the audience. And if they look interested, I stay on that topic for a while. And that, that would make the military wince. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll throw something out there. Uh, something I thought for sure we would be absolutely crucified for in the uh, in the film when it came out was the uh, uh, radio interceptions uh, being made by the uh, uh, submarine commanders, where they were taunting our guys on on TBS, which is what we call uh, a very high frequency radio now VHF. Uh, I explained to the production that yes, it was possible for a submarine receiver to accidentally hit upon a duplex channel and hear escorts talking. 
uh, but it was absolutely impossible for them to transmit and uh, and basically uh, interfere with their own transmissions. And the uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, producers cocked his head at me and said, why? And I said, well, first thing that radio operator would have to do is make a microphone out of stuff he already had in his, his submarine. They did not use voice radio. Everything was Morse. And then I said, then he'd have to build a, trans a radio transmitter that could transmit duplex channels the way TBS or VHF works so that he could actually communicate and work when the fact is that such a device was a war-winning secret then that our guys had borrowed from the RAF and were beginning to use. Uh, so uh, I expected people to crucify us for that. Uh, they, they didn't generally, although in some of my talks, people have brought that up. I was particularly bothered too that um, I thought uh, the um, I thought it was important that the submarine commanders be just as professional and and somber and uh, and uh, and skilled as our guys were. That makes them more terrible. I, I asked uh, one point my colleagues to imagine the submarine commander in the superb Battle of the Atlantic film Das Boot so losing control of himself that he would start making animal noises. Uh, I I didn't think that was a naval officer. And uh, uh, but at any rate. Uh, it's a movie, and part of the movie's job is to be entertaining. And because, as Peter Weir said, when you pick up the book, the words fall out, things had to be done to show the ferocity of the fighting. And that was one of the devices the production chose to pick. Any more questions for anybody? Now is your time. The other problem, Gordon, with, with the TBS, as I've been doing some research since you signaled that in, in, our, in our discussions, is that the damn things were with all of the equipment associated, we were, there were nine cubic meters space. There wouldn't be any room for that on a sub. <laughs> that, that's right. And, uh, and the, uh, the radio protocols we showed in the film were very much American infantry, 1960s in style. Uh, I, I tried to describe to the production that in, in the winter of 1942, it should be like basketball players shouting to each other on the field or like fighter pilots in the Battle of Britain saying, there's one on your tail, I'm coming around, yeah. and, and things like that. And uh, yes, there was confusion sometimes because they were still learning how to use them. <clears throat> By the way, I should say, if, if anybody notices in the brief instance in the chart table scene when we're seeing what the uh, uh, radius of uh, air cover is, I had to come up with a date to put on the running plot position. And all CS Forrester said was it was the winter uh, of 42, I figured it would take three or four months for a warship to work up and get out to sea. That brought us to February. I needed to pick a day. Well, February 2nd is my birthday. I figured that was a bit <laughs> narcissistic. So I made it February 12th, my, wife, my wife's birthday. <laughs> Gord, I was impressed that the Americans were known for talking far too much on TBS. You yes. could always tell if you're getting near an American ship or a convoy, but there's all sorts of talk. The British were, weren't bad. The Dutch wouldn't talk to you at all when they were escorting. And I was impressed at that uh, in the movie that that didn't come across. You didn't have the impression that they were talking all the time back and forth because that wasn't a good idea because no. the Germans could pick it up and uh, that gave them a fix. And I, thinking back on the movie uh, that I saw on, on the screen, uh, I didn't get that impression. And I thought that was a, a nice control on your part because they were known for talking far too much on TBS. Well, here's another thing involving nationalities, Fraser. Uh, in the original, uh, earlier versions of the script, when the bridge of Hanks' destroyer is raked with machine gun fire, originally that was from the Canadian Corvette in the scene when they're both after the U-boat. I didn't like that at all. I did not like that at all. And I told Mr. Hanks, uh, I said politely, I said, Tom, I said, we are depicting a very American sort of error and, and, and attributing it to a Canadian ship <laughs> who were known to be careful. And so we, he, he looked at me and kind of cocked his head and smiled and uh, the, the ship uh, emitting the gunfire is now a merchant vessel. <laughs> oh, that's right, they'd fire at anybody. <laughs> oh, uh, Gordon, I wonder um, on, on the in the movie or on your experience on board ship, if you uh, had occasion to use astro navigation at all. 
Yes, I uh, uh, I didn't use it in the Navy, uh, but I did use it a lot in my uh, sailing days in uh, in yachts and schooners. Uh, I uh, I have to say I, I love uh, traditional astro navigation. I love that feeling of being reminded that I'm a speck in the universe that's crawling across a water planet. And I especially love that to make all the formulas work, you assume that the Earth is the center of the universe and everything is equidistant and moves around it. I think that's just wonderful. <laughs> and that is the way it works. That is the way it works. Yep. Center of the universe. Sure. I need to make another good speaker. And you probably do it too. I need to be another good speaker for probit. Yeah. I, um, well, yeah. Uh, excuse me. I Hi. want to thank you for Hi. the presentation. Hi, David. The uh, introduction when you talk about Richard Bailey and HMS Rose. As it turns out, I sailed on in the HMS Rose from Boston to Bristol uh, when it went to Bristol in uh, 1996. Wonderful. So I thought that was uh, very interesting and brought back, you know, 26 years of. Uh, memory for me that was a, an incredible trip and he was an outstanding captain so uh, he is isn't he he's remained a close friend and i guess you remember jackal his dog oh yeah that that was two years later when he did the uh yeah uh east coast u.s uh well trip, poor but, jack poor jackal passed away a few years ago well, that's and, too bad. Uh, he, that was you know if you were to ever do a documentary on that rose crossing that would be uh i know it's many years later but that was really uh, first class. There were most well, of us were we... over fifty years old, and and the no. kids there were mainly from Texas uh, universities and and no. people who uh, had signed on for the for the duration of the trip. Well, I've made note of your name, and I'll say hi to Richard. Uh, he often remembers people that sailed with him. Oh yeah, he would because we were there for I think it was a seven week trip. We went from uh, Boston to Bristol. Good. It was a lot of fun. Well, Jackal is at rest under a piece of Rose's <laughs> name mask right now. We, uh, Richard thought that was the best way to honor that good dog. Absolutely. Could I ask a question about the insignia on the funnel of Dickey? There was a big make belief. Did all the Canadian ships have those in World War II? Uh, yes. Uh, they were not all uniform. They were stylized somewhat. And I did manage to keep the barber pole. Oh, good. Uh, uh, so uh, that was your I, idea. Well, it was already on the ship, and I had to explain what it was. And uh, we we had discussions about every vessel we used, uh, deciding which features of them could remain, because of course warships they all served after the war too, and uh, which things could stay and which had to go. Uh, for example, Haida had been defanged uh, for the Korean War uh, with four-inch guns rather than four point sevens. Uh, we got them back in there. And if you see the fleeting glimpses of the British tribal in the film, you'll see she's properly armed. Thank you. You're welcome, Lynn. The Maple Leaf, I think, only came back periodically. The Canadians got rather tired of being overlooked and considered as Royal Navy. So they began doing it, but it was period. By the end of the war, they were pretty well all worn. But uh, early on, uh, not very much. The barber pole went up almost right away as soon as it was formed of the original Corvettes. Thank you, Fraser. That's it, that's it. Any more questions? No complaints? <laughs> no complaints. No. Not at all. I think very well done. I'll say. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gordon, for uh, really in-depth mm -hmm. and outstanding mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. behind the scenes. Thank you. I mean, she just looks like a nice old lady. Fraser, you're online. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why you do something? You know, thank you. You know, um, <laughs> thank you, Gordon. Um, usually at this time I, I present our speaker with a gift uh, from our CMI as a thank you. However, for the present situation, it's just not possible. So um, Canada Post will do the job for me. So keep a lookout. Thank, thank you, Patricia. You. And I'll look forward to meeting you in, uh, at our CMI sometime. As yes. I said before the uh, evening started, my yes. wife and I can't wait to start going again. Yeah, mutual. Yeah. Um, I must tell you a little thing. It's nothing to do with your presentation, really. But um, when I first came to Canada, 
I got a job at Canadian Girl Guides. And my job, uh, we um, outfitted the, um, the guide leaders with the uh, World War II Wren uniforms. Ah. And uh, they sold for $25, because that was my job. I was just a teenager. And yeah. I had to fit these ladies with these uh, World War II Wren, Wren uniforms. Now, you can't get them there for love and the money. But in those days, uh, it was, um, you know, that's what they did. Yeah, that would be in the late 50s. Anyway, that's my little contribution. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for your participation. And I now declare this meeting ended. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.